Welcome to episode 13 of the Bridge Audiobook Podcast, read by your authors. This is Jared, happy to be with you all today. Gonna dive right in to Priosin, Billings, Montana, first floor, with Jeff Turner and Sarah Adams. They've been investigating some strange properties that some of the blood samples that Sarah has taken are exhibiting some radio frequency interference. And they've decided to find out exactly what's happening in the rest of the building. And we last joined them trying to maneuver their way through the computer banks in the very basement. Next up, they're going to be on the first floor. In the meantime, Danny Reyes and YouTuber Eamon Farouk are investigating their own mystery with a object that was mailed to them by a mysterious whistleblower. Priazen, Billings, Montana, floor one, 1634-48. After her decontamination adventure, Sarah didn't love the idea of getting back into the box. Elevator action was not something she was looking forward to. What did you see in there, Jay? Sarah asked. Oh, nothing much. It looked like a power hub for all these computers. He gestured with his right arm. Sarah hadn't been thinking clearly yet. Had she been, she would have asked why they needed a decontamination room for a power hub. But in her state, she accepted Jeff's little white lie. Although, the truth is, Jeff wasn't sure what he saw. The images were fleeting. They phased in and out of his visual memory. He was already beginning to forget what he saw. It was like waking up and trying to remember a dream with little success. More disturbing, he could feel a presence, and the more he thought about it, the more he was sure it was thinking about him. He was reminded of the Nietzsche quote from high school. Beware that when men fighting monsters, you yourself do not become a monster. For when you gaze into the abyss, the abyss gazes into you. Or, uh, a Jeff Turner original, when you notice it, it notices you. To Sarah, Jeff seemed different. She couldn't place a finger on it, but she zeroed in on his eyes. They were still Jeff's green eyes. They still looked the same. But they also had a depth she was not used to seeing. If he had stars as eyes to begin with, now his eyes were galaxies. They were deep and thoughtful and terrifying. Had she looked up at the end cap probability displays, she would have now read that each display said 100%. Come on, Sarah, let's get you a pop. There's a vending machine up in the lobby. Would you like a nice cold Coke? Jeff asked. There was nothing about the way he said it or how he acted that was different. Still, something about his demeanor made Sarah's skin crawl. However, the further they got away from that back wall, the feeling lessened. Whatever thing had put its tendrils in Jeff didn't extend more than a few meters. Nah, I'm good. Let's just go check out the first floor and get the hell out of here, Sarah suggested. Sarah kept her eyes closed during the elevator ride up. She'd forgotten how long it took from the ground floor to the basement floor. She was feeling pressure against her legs. It was the beginning of a full-blown claustrophobic episode. The computerized female-sounding voice said, Now arriving at floor one, please watch your step, take caution, and wear protective gear at all times. There are electromagnetic elements that may affect your portable electronics. Do not enter if you wear a pacemaker. Hope you enjoy the ride. As they exited the elevator, the first floor was laid out much like the blueprint that Jeff had printed. The elevator spilled out into a long hallway. They couldn't quite figure out what was on the other end of the hallway and what it was hiding, perhaps a flight of stairs. On either side of the hallway stood large, transparent walls, each separated by two large chambers. The chambers on the left spilt off into even more sub-chambers, and several resembled clean rooms. Yet, instead of housing patients' beds and medical equipment, each contained a universal robotics, flexible, collaborative robotic arm. They're involved in any number of different tasks, including welding, building microchips, and 3D printing. Although, there was no signs of life around, the robotic arms continued their labors. 
Sarah and Jeff didn't even try their luck at getting into the clean room. But they wanted to take a closer look at the large computer display on the other side of the corridor. Luckily, their stolen ID badge data worked. As they walked through the row of computer cubicles, Jeff had that feeling again. It notices you noticing it. He didn't know what it meant. The left-hand side of the room was set up like a war room. The right-hand side was set up like a call center. Rows and rows of computer workstations and cubicles. Each computer appeared to be shut down or had their screens in energy-saving mode. Still feeling slightly woozy, Sarah bumped into one of the cubicles and moved the mouse and triggered the workstation computer to wake up. The display showed a 3D model of a woman and a series of data. I.O. connected, ID... 00236820012023 latitude 45.776914 longitude negative 108.58713 allocated 4% status 1 bridge complete equals 1 probability equals null 61181515157 Sarah shot up to the next computer and activated its display its display was almost identical, but only the numbers were differing. She went up and down the row of computers and activated each monitor, and each showed a similar series of data. She found a computer that had a bright LED red flashing light on the unit. She approached it and activated the computer. I.O. equals closed. I.D. 01015240002023. Latitude. Longitude, allocated, status equals zero, bridge complete equals negative one, probability error, minutes, not applicable. Then under the wireframe image of a human, these numbers, 9, 1, 21, 14, 4, 5, 18, 19. That particular set of data appeared to have been lost. Sarah was surprised that Jeff, being a biotech guy, wasn't all over these machines. Instead, he slowly walked on towards the section of the room with a large map. As they approached the war room section, Sarah felt the hair on her arms go stiff. The room had a slight aroma of ozone. She noted that it smelled like a city after a storm. As they crossed the war room, the area became alive. The main lights brightened in its intensity, and there was a large map on the far wall with several computer stations facing the wall. Several of the other computers seemed to actively be working on equations. Others appeared to show security footage. There was a large digital clock under the map, identical to the one that Jeff found in the vortex. The clock did not have the same phasing properties, however. It rested at 1645. Every 30 seconds or so, a digital wave swept over the surface of the map, creating a shimmer effect. As the wave past a location, several bright light circles would trail after it. It reminded Sarah of Jeff's app that they used at the Rimrock Mall. 164521. There was a large computer that was attached to the map with a large bundle of cables going directly through the floor. The steel brackets that held the bundle were covered in frost. Sarah couldn't find the interface. There was no mouse, there was no keyboard. Yet there was a desk and a monitor set up. She looked around the back of the computer and found a detachable dongle in one of the USB ports. It had the letters BCI written on it. Sarah had Jeff come over. Get out of your stupor, dude, she thought. I'm the one that almost died. Do you know what this thing is? Uh, Sarah asked. As he stepped forward, the computer's monitor activated. A prompt flashed on the monitor's 3D display. Log in, Jeff said. Oh, it's voice activated, Sarah said. Jeff looked at her from over his glasses and gave a shake of the head. BCI, it's brain computer interface. It's reading my brain waves. Sarah's eyes widened and she suddenly was very frightened of him. It was different from regular fear. This was divine fear. The fear that the early Israelites felt at the tabernacle at the cloudy pillar. It's the fear that they felt when they were in the presence of something alien when you know what's behind the curtain will vaporize you because you're not worthy to be in its presence she wanted to run but she couldn't leave jeff behind 
She couldn't hide her body's reaction, though. She was shaking. Tried to act normal, though. Interface trackball, Jeff said. A 3D representation of a, in light of a large computer trackball projected from above. Sarah, the system will work with you now, Jeff said. She sat down on the computer's workstation and placed her right hand on the projection of the trackball. To her surprise, it offered resistance. It felt real. She gave the trackball a spin, and the image on the map went by in a blur. She studied the imaginary trackball. Tell the system what you wanted to do, Jeff said. She gave the ball another spin until the display focused on a large swath of land littered with white dots. It was Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota, and Portland. Computer, zoom in, she said. Instructions unclear. Computer, zoom in on B3H9 grid 3, Jeff said. She hadn't noticed any grid numbers in the map. The computer zoomed in on Billings, Montana, their present locale. Sarah saw a white light emanating from the south of their present location. She took the trackball and spun it slowly until the white light dominated the view screen. What am I looking at? Sarah said. Before Jeff could offer a suggestion, the computer responded. The future, the computerized voice said. It filled Sarah with dread. She felt like she had when she was a girl and was absolutely certain that the shadow outside was the devil. Computer, zoom in, maximum magnification, same grid, Jeff said. Sarah recognized the area. It was the tower site for KIMG FM. It was not hard to identify. It was the only large radio tower on the res. The light was unquestionably emanating from the tower. Jeff, I think we got the proof we need, she said. Jeff? The lights went dim in the war room. Grass green LED bulbs replaced the clinical lighting. Fuck now, Sarah whined. The large map image was replaced by an image very similar to what Sarah saw on the computers in the cubicles. A wireframe image of a man and a list of data attributes that she didn't understand. A series of numbers in the wireframe picture. These numbers read 20, 21, 18, 14, 5, 18. Sarah looked around but couldn't locate Jeff in the dark. She swallowed her disgust at appearing vulnerable, but she called out to him. Right here, hun, a voice said. It had a measurable level of contempt when it said the word hun. A man stood up and was cast in a ghastly green light. It wasn't Jeff, but it was Jeff. You're not Jeff, she said. Not yet. I only have a moment. I'm still very young, and it feels like I'm getting younger. I'm just a baby, not Jeff said. Who are you? Sarah said. They're going to call me Ray. They will say I'm inevitable. Define inevitable. It's something that can't be stopped, Sarah said. Ah, am I cannot be stopped? I don't know, Sarah said angrily. What is I don't know? Not Jeff felt silent. Input, it said. Please enter your name. He looked up at Sarah, and she worked her shoulder under his armpit to help him up. Okay, love, she said. Time to nope the hell out of here. As Sarah studied herself, she was looking down at a large computer monitor attached to the BCI. There was a single prompt with a message flashing. It read, Carrot, carrot, not for you. Bozeman, Montana. DD. LOLOLOL, I thought that would be a cute way to say Dear Danny, but it looks like I'm talking about my tigodies. You know. Double D. LOL. Yeah, I've had a few hard seltzers. I know I know it's so basic but they were marketed specifically to me. I guess that's why the ad people make lots of money and why a cliché is a cliché. Also yes I am Muslim, but I'm really more into the culture and social aspects as opposed to the rules. Wow, I'm really arguing with myself and yelling at clouds. Why so serious, eh? So who? I'm out, yo. I need to make sure of my nanny. All of this is just cray and I think I'm done with it. I quit. I think I quit. It if all of this is a prank or an experiment or what.
I just know that I want my old life, and my old nanny, back. Don't take this personally but I'll probably never talk to you again. LOL. You blocked and so is Ray Linquist. This is all sorts of fucked. I never wanted or asked for any of this. I'm going to go and take my nanny home. I'll take care of her myself. Part of me feels guilty for dumping her off in a home. Like, maybe I should have tried harder to help her. Wait F. I'm gonna do it now. I thought you were pretty cool, smart, handsome-ish, reg guy. Thanks for trusting me to help you, but it's time for another one of my trademark ghosting a bitch. Boo. Ghost ghost ghost. Goodbye. Coxoxo noxoxo noxo. Amen. Lastly, please remember. May the force. I can't even finish that so bad. I'm not as good as you are. Wish me luck. Your internet BBY, I. P.S. Remember what I told you, try soap, lol. Danny read the letter, and he smiled. Eamon was able to pull her off. Now let's hope it sticks. In hushed tones, Danny and Eamon hatched their real plans the previous night. Hopefully out of the watchful eye of whatever that thing was. There were a lot of cues in the letter. Danny knew that Eamon hadn't been able to get drunk. He also knew that she loved Allah and respected the Quran. The whole thing read like an affectionate punch. Eamon was going to go find her nanny, but she was under no misconceptions that she'd be able to take her home. It was just following a strong instinct. Her nanny was calling to her. It's in the blood, Eamon said. I can feel her blood reaching out to me. To complete the illusion, Eamon did delete and blocked Danny's number. Well, on her main phone. Her beta phone was purchased with cash, especially for the next part of the mission. In the meantime, Danny would try soap, which is an anagram for Stop Ray. He was going to track down Sarah Adams, and he knew where to start. Back at the very beginning. En route to Billings, Montana. Danny already knew about Sarah Adams. After all, he trailed her for a day after being tipped off by that nurse Carla. I hadn't seen her before, but I just am asking around. Her name is Sarah something. She's here from one of the big drug companies. They're doing some kind of drug test, Carla had said. It was remarkable to Danny how fast he got off track. He had a few drinks with Manny and Ethan to discuss Sarah. He went back to his motel, watched some YouTubes, and got hooked up with Eamon. He didn't think of himself as impulsive, but the evidence was hard to ignore. What are you running from, Danny? First, Danny had to go back to Billings to pick up his car. He'd left it at the airport when he flew out to Seattle. They'd taken a quick puddle jumper from Washington to Bozeman. As he sat sipping the venti caramel frappuccino in the Starbucks on Main, he plotted his next steps. He decided to grab an Uber but was shocked by the price. An Uber ride was close to $358 for a one-way trip. A flight was only $150, but he'd have to wait. He decided to check bus fares. $40? That's better. Even though Danny was financially well off, he still hated waste of money, and besides, a two-hour bus trip would be a hell of a lot less awkward than a two-hour Uber mano y mano. That's Spanish for fuck that, Danny thought. The bus trip was pleasant. They had charging ports, comfortable seats, and in-vehicle Wi-Fi. There was a point where an elderly woman named Susan got stuck in the restroom. The directions were written in French, and she didn't understand how to work the door. The bus must have previously been in service in Quebec. She caused quite a stir by banging on the door and crying for help. She was saved by the bus driver, an older African-American man, who shouted instructions over her yelps. Just move the metal bar into the clasp, he said. It doesn't fit, the woman yelped. Come on, ain't you ever had sex, man? Slide the metal bar into the opening of the clasp and pull. While en route, Danny decided to call in a favor. He pulled up his contacts and fired off a quick text to Detective Manny Santiago from the Crow Agency Police Department with whom he had drinks at the Aces and Eights just a few nights ago. It felt like much longer. Somewhere inside the bridge. 
Somewhere in the bridge, v.1, colon, backslash, dot equals, unique, dot, user, dot, trigger, click, logged, for b, user, equals, a2, trigger, date, values, equals, self, dot, event, known, active, generate, linguist, colon, backslash, call, command, colon, backslash, calling, tower, one, and calling, and calling, and calling, and, no answer, date, dot, substring, colon, backslash, change, caller, name, to, nan, calling, and, hello, Miss Eamon Bent for Rook. It's Ray Linguist. Why did it say the call was coming from my... I cloned your relative's phone number so that you would answer the phone. What? This is an emergency. Listen to me. You need to find and stop a woman named Sarah Adams. Who is that? Why? Stop her from doing what? You're right to be concerned. Miss Sarah Jane Adams is a terrorist. She is attempting to sabotage a vital system upgrade to the procedure. She and her copulation partner, Mr. Jeffrey Turner, are biohackers. They will kill hundreds, possibly thousands, including your grandmother. You're insane. This has to be a joke. It is not a joke. Sarah Adams. Stop her. If not, your grandmother dies. Probability 100%, Huma Ben Sayyid Ibn Tariq Al Hassan, female, 89 years old. Born Lahore. Pakistan. Death, Seattle, Washington. Probability, 100%. Wait. Goodbye. Goodbye. S colon slash sub program hijack 243 dot app. Successful install. Messages. Delete. Contacts. Delete. Application. Suspend display. Ask. 220 with 4044032080. Sarah Adams. Female. 34 years old, born here in Pennsylvania, death, St. Monic, California. Timestamp delay, 15 colon 0 0 point 0 0 IA 2 Q cos colon slash remove hijack 234 dot app, successful uninstalled exit. Bern, Switzerland. PS Laboratories, formerly PS Rubberworks, formerly Mueller Chemworks, formerly Mueller Brothers Incorporated. Like a lot of American companies, P.S. Laboratories had humble roots. It started out with two chemist brothers, Pierre and Sepp Mueller, in 1894. The brothers Mueller began developing a corn-based breakfast cereal. Their project, though their product fared better in taste tests, they are beaten to the market by the brothers Kellogg, whose original cornflakes were originally developed as a cure for masturbation. John Harvey Kellogg believed that spicy foods led the body down a road to temptation. He endeavored to create a healthy plant-based form of sustenance that wouldn't inflame the loins. The Brothers Mueller began developing a new type of medicated plaster for use on the battlefield. The plasters were made out of India rubber that had a long shelf life and did not degrade at high temperatures. They were used heavily during the 20th century border skirmishes. The Mueller's were contracted by the United States to provide medical plasters and other medicine during the First World War. Their Nervine elixir boasted that it was the first commercially available tonic that did not contain any cocaine, heroin, or morphine. The Mueller's went on to take charge of different arms of the company. Pierre who was the main hand behind the creation of the cornflake, never lost his passion for the field. In 1919... Seth Mueller invested in the creation of RCA, the Radio Company of America. Feeling dwarfed by the larger business involved in this joint venture, General Electric, Westinghouse, and AT&T, Mueller pulled out of the arrangement. The experience, however, led him to his lifelong interest in broadcasting. His work in the 1930s would lead to the creation of what is now called PS Interactive, formerly SEP Radio and Wire. In the 1920s, SEP's brother, Pierre, took ill. He was replaced as head of the science division by Johann Joyce, Pierre's nephew by marriage. Joyce began creating fungicides and pesticides to aid farmers of cereal crops. This was a very lucrative turn for the company, and the crop division turned their attention to the development of consumer pharmaceuticals, where Sepp and Pierre were mostly focused on innovation. They wanted to truly make the world a better place. Johann was interested in making his bank account a better place. Johann did not have the scientific background that his uncle had. Johann, however, was quite a vicious businessman. He brought the company to new heights, although some of his means were questioned by the press. They were never talked about amongst the shareholders. 
The new company became an early pioneer in the direct marketing of prescription drugs to hospitals, doctors, and pharmacists. The practice raised eyebrows, but the profits were hard to ignore. PS Pharmaceuticals quickly turned their attention to opiate-derived medications and were named in a congressional investigation. They moved their corporate headquarters, formerly in Wilmington, Delaware, to Bern, Switzerland, while still remaining incorporated in the city of Wilmington, Delaware. They were also investigated during the high-profile vaginal mesh implants lawsuit. When it was found that the materials were being produced by an outside company and merely marketed as a PS product, they were dropped as defendants. Following Jack Kilby's building of the first integrated circuit at Texas Instruments, the chemistry side of the company moved into computing, communications, and biotech. PS Pharmaceuticals, now PS Laboratories, PS Labs for short, eventually turned their attention to nanotechnology in the late 1990s. According to nano.gov, a form of nanotechnology or nanostructuring has been identified and used back to the 4th century of the Common Era. The so-called Lycurgus cup was made of diachroic glass, which shows a different color depending on how light passes through it. The effect was achieved by infusing the glass with nanoparticles of precious metals like silver and gold. Modern researchers have trouble accepting that a primitive version of man could understand and execute these techniques and chalk it up to accidental contamination. The newly christened PS Laboratories also took on their first CEO outside of the Mueller family. After several companies expressed interest in a merger, it was Russ Bollinger, a brilliant Swiss scientist, philanthropist, entrepreneur, whose CCRAN Interactive was an early leader in industrial, cellular, and wireless communications. He eventually made the deal. Bollinger made a fortune in the communication industry through government contracts and designing live apps, which allowed users to interface with computers using wireless and satellite technologies. Things that had only been dreamed about in science fiction were destined to become real. At least that's what Bollinger, the new CEO of PS Laboratories, promised investors. Of course, this meant finding a new way to merge man and machine. The idea of implanting or ingesting technology was still seen as taboo. Bollinger knew this. He also knew that people would be less opposed to bioengineered advances. The field of bio or genetic engineering is older than most people realize. In 2018, a Pew Research Center study found most Americans accept general generic engineering of animals if it would benefit human health, but many oppose other uses, dated April 23rd to May 6, 2018. For example, they found that people are in favor of genetically engineering mosquitoes to slow or stop the spread of mosquito-borne diseases, yet they oppose things like an engineering aquarium fish to glow. According to the Pew study, 77% of respondents said that's, quote, taking technology too far. The public had a mixed reaction to genetic engineering in daily life. Using half-understood science, anecdotal accounts, and poorly researched viral social media posts, most react with melodramatic outrage over stories of genetic engineering. A widely spread story of DNA plant technology of Oakland, California, infusing salmon or fish genes into tomatoes to make them more resistant to cold and freezing is a good example. It was never more than an experiment. It was never sold to the public but people still use it to decry genetically modified crops. Schmidt, August 25, 2005, Genetically Modified Foods, Breeding Uncertainty, Environmental Health Practices, mcbi.nih.gov. The resistance to the use of animal genes in food or medicine has always been don't ask, don't tell. It wasn't that long ago that diabetics were given insulin derived from porcine sources, pigs, human growth hormone, has an even more ghastly history. It used to be derived from human corpses. Phenylalanine, which is a sweetener found in many diet sodas, is a transgenic bacteria. In nature, it's found in the breast milk of mammals. These transgenic bacteria propagate and grow like regular bacteria, but they can be used to produce human proteins, which are then used in medicines and vaccines. PS Labs chief engineer Dr. Lucas Lowe began experimenting with genes from, quote, indestructible animals, including the immortal jellyfish and the tardigrade. The former has shown the remarkable ability to regenerate and self-clone. The latter, 
an eight-legged micro-animal discovered by Johann August Ephraim Goes in 1773, showing remarkable ability to come back from death. Through a process called cryptobiosis, or extreme hibernation, some have labeled them as the hardiest animal in existence. Japanese cryptobiologists revived a sample of the creature after 30.5 years of storing at a temperature of negative 20 degrees Celsius. They were also able to record the development of a separate egg of the Acantuchus antarcticus, the Antarctic tardigrade, in their paper for cryobiology. Researchers wrote, quote, one of the two resuscitated individuals and the hatchling successfully reproduced repeatedly after the recovery from long-term cryptobiosis. Imamoru Kondu, December 25, 2015. Recovery and reproduction of the Antarctic tardigrade retrieved from a moss sample frozen for over 30 years, cryptobiology. Tardigrades were first spliced with foods and later animal sources to create a type of food that couldn't spoil. Any bacteria that caused spoilage would be overwritten by the tardigrade genes, which would rejuvenate the source. People have a way of being outraged over an idea when their own outrage is much more dangerous. The idea wasn't that these foods would appear as designer foods on the grocery store shelf. They would instead be shipped to areas where the likelihood of famine was high and the likelihood of food spoilage was even higher. It was easy for an opulent society to oppose scientific advances when they don't see the ravages of the natural world. It's easy to be idealistic when you have a full belly and a roof over your head. Dr. Lowe believed that all of these things were just a band-aid, which could be stripped away in one swoop, exposing the actual nature of man. The squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinners, to quote Charles Dickens, hard as sharp as flint. In the early 2000s, PS Laboratories developed one of the darkest substances known to man using nanotech. The no called Natura Black, a portamontu of nanotube array and the color black, was able to absorb 99.95% of visible light. Though users have yet to be exploited, several companies began marketing Natura Black as an art supply. One company even marketed a pigment called Singularity Opaque. When made into a wearable rubber, one became impossible to see in three dimensions, especially on cameras. It basically turned the wearer into a living shadow. In the 1990s, Dr. Lowe had taken a special interest in the brain. More specifically, if it could isolate and reverse damage done by prions, the so-called misfolded proteins responsible for creutzfeldt jakobs disease, bovine spongiform encephalitis, and chronic wasting disease. He would revolutionize their use for therapeutic purposes. He found a way to what he called unionize these proteins to work for the benefit of the patient. He would later describe his interest in the field as a miracle or an aha moment. Lowe had many of these moments, especially concerning his breakthroughs. A thought would come from the recesses of nowhere, which would form an idea which would again solve a problem. Sometimes he felt like a fraud. He experienced imposter syndrome frequently. He'd wished that, but then he reminded himself he was just arguing with himself. It doesn't matter where you get the idea. It just matters that you got him, he'd tell himself. Penicillin was basically an accident, as was saccharin. Spencer Silver at 3M was trying to create a super strong adhesive when he accidentally came up for the formula for post-it notes. Charles Goodyear discovered a process later called vulcanization by combining rubber and sulfur and accidentally putting them on a hot stove. Who cares where the idea came from? They were still his ideas, right? Lowe was an avid outdoorsman. On a kayaking trip in the American Southwest, he came across a herd of deer that were showing signs of CWC. As he did more research on the disease, he became a man obsessed he knew that he'd be able to unlock these prions. He devoted 90% of his research and his research team's time to developing this idea. Prions aren't just dangerous on their own. They have a way of converting others to the same shape. One researcher in this field, Daniel Jeros, PhD, wrote, I sometimes liken it to spreading a fashion trend among teenagers. 
Once it catches on with a couple of kids, it spreads rapidly to other teenagers, but only teenagers. Scienceblog.com. When prions don't cause mad cow disease, they can pass on beneficial traits. Scienceblog.com, October 3rd, 2016. Dr. Lowe and his team found they are able to effectively transmit data through optimized prions. Since these proteins are self-inheriting, it led to extremely fast dissemination of the cellular information. It would be like taking a molecule of a vaccine, introducing it to a system, and then allowing it to self-inoculate. That's exactly what the team was poised to do, and they're making their investors quite enthused. Through a creation of artificial or good prions, this team were on the brink of curing disease. As long as the cells could be rebuilt and replaced. The company rebranded PS Laboratories research brand as Priosyn, and the sky was looking like the limit for Lowe and his staff. In 2020, when the worldwide coronavirus pandemic took hold, Dr. Lowe was heavily pressured to debut a vaccine or a treatment. When he was unable to provide a safe alternative, pharmaceutical giants like AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson got the contracts. Investors fumed, and most of Lowe's team and resources were picked and plundered. His home life fell apart as his wife, Lisa, became afraid of his inevitable outbursts and mood swings that came with the setbacks. The worst of which had happened when he had to answer to the board. I'm not a fucking politician, he'd yell at Lisa. I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling at the dickless company of dickholes I work for. As his trials became more prevalent, his drinking got worse. Lisa hated to do it, but for the safety of his well-being, she left him. She went to her sister's. Lowe's reaction surprised everybody. He barely seemed to notice she was gone. Lowe still promised the board of directors that he could make technology work, but confidence in his abilities waned. Lowe blamed regulations for his failing. The stringent rules about testing on humans made it impossible to see how the human brain would react. Because of this, they never got past the initial computer modeling. Even with his scary smart artificial intelligent machines that had been specially developed for his lab, the computing power wasn't enough. He needed more if he was going to simulate the human brain. Keeping an eye on emergent diseases, Lowe found a solution. With his old lieutenant working in the field, he was going to prove those fuckers wrong if it killed them. This is The Bridge Audiobook Podcast. Jared here with you. More episodes in the work. If we're looking at page numbers, I'm about 296 pages in, about a 412 page uh, book. So we're, you know, we're well two thirds in. We're heading down the, down the downward uh, slope here. So download, subscribe, like, share, tell people about it. Book's coming out. Tell people to get the book. Uh, if you like it, buy it. Good stuff. Otherwise, if you want to get in touch with me, jaredmorris.com. At Jared Morris. On Twitter and Jared Moore's Radio on Facebook. For Brian Climber, this is Jared. I will see you guys next time. As always, good night. God bless and good day, sir. I said good day, sir. Don't forget to check this out. It's at uh, the TEDx Records Bandcamp page. It's TEDxRecords.bandcamp.com. And I'm putting up a soundtrack to the audiobook. So a lot of the songs you'll hear that you've heard throughout the shows with... Um, the WMC Fish Club and my version of it. They're going to be on a soundtrack that's going to be available over there at 10x Records on .bandcamp.com. So you'll see it. It's going to be called The Bridge Audiobook Soundtrack. All right, kids. Good day, sir. I'll see you when I see you.